evening, ghouls and fiends. Welcome once again to another edition of the Ministry of Horror. I'm your host, Tez, and we we are back once again. Um, as per usual, it's 31 days of Halloween, 31 days of horror. Uh, that has been rolling on pretty well. We're still doing pretty darn well. There's been a couple of days where I've had to double up because I've missed a previous day. But all in all, it's it's been fairly successful. Um, just to kind of give a quick recap, I'm pretty sure the last show I'd got up until Barbara Crampton Day, which I watched Reborn, and that was kind of shit. For Possession Horror, I watched The Dark and the Wicked on Shudder. Been meaning to watch it for, for ages since it came out, I just never got around to it, then I forgot about it. it it's decent. It's pretty grisly. Um, but it's got some pretty good scares in it. Um, it's pretty good. And then for A24, I went with Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Uh, that's all right. Um, it was decent the first time I saw it when it came out. Uh, in comparison to other A24 films, it doesn't necessarily hold up to repeat viewings, I would say. Uh, what else did we watch? So, for Korean horror, I went for The Tale of Two Sisters. Now, I have struggled with that on account of finding the time to be able to sit and properly watch because obviously it's a Korean film. It's got English subtitles. There isn't a dubbed copy available on streaming that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, and I normally prefer to watch films in their native language with subtitles, but you have to be fully engaged and it's not something you can just put on in the background. So I've watched bits and pieces of that. Um, and then for the cult coven day, I watched The Void. I'd forgotten how gnarly that is. Like some of the kills in that are just really inventive and pretty horrifying. Particularly the uh, the old cop who gets grabbed by the mass of tentacles and flesh, and it's just continuously pushing tentacles through his eyeballs. That's just a horrible shot. And there's quite a few other horrible shots in it, but it is very good. Uh, really good um, Lovecraftian horror, I would say. Enjoyed that. Then for Christopher Lee Day, I went with the 1959 The Mummy. That's pretty good. I I hadn't ever seen the Hammer version of The Mummy. Liked it. Dug it. Um, where did we then get to? So, for the horror two days ago, uh, I can't remember what the theme for that was. I went with The Witch. So whichever day the 24th is, I can't be bothered to scroll up and find it. I, I went with The Witch, which I think might have just been witchcraft, potentially. Not sure. Uh, or period piece. That was it. I think that was it, period piece. Went with The Witch. And then for the should have won an Oscar, there was a toss-up between It Follows and Hereditary. Because I love It Follows. And I love Hereditary. And Tony Collette and Hereditary should have won an Oscar. But I ended up going with Pearl. Because I just think that that's such a standout, not just in the trilogy, uh, the X, Maxine and Pearl trilogy, um, but just in terms of creating that authentic feel for old Hollywood, uh, I, I really, 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 really dug it. Mia Goth's incredible in that. So I went with that uh, yesterday. So today's Alfred Hitchcock. I'm hoping to watch uh, some point today or tonight, Rear Window. I've never seen it. I've seen versions of it done elsewhere or copies and uh, the most fa the one that always sticks out to me is the simpsons when bart breaks his leg that's a clear send-up of that uh, but i'm hoping to watch that um and that then brings us to the films that i've watched outside of the 31 days of halloween for review today so we've got a film called natty Knox that i had been toying with renting for a little while because it's got quite a good cast of horror classic actors in it but then it dropped onto, Di uh, not Disney Plus, Paramount Plus. So, saved myself five pounds. Um, I also watched Carved, which we mentioned on the news the other week, part of the Huluween. Um, That's also on, that's not also, but that's on Disney Plus, similar to Mr. Crockett. And then I went to the cinema last night to watch Smile 2. So that's going to be our kind of our main review for the show. Uh, outside of that, I've done bits and bobs of gaming with... Um, Silent Hill 2, the PS5. And also, if you're a Nintendo gamer at all, uh, or have a Switch, I mean, I've got a Switch, but it is normally gathering dust. I, I don't really find myself playing it very often. But I had a look on the store, 
and they've got a hell of a sale on at the moment. I picked up like a Harvest Moon game because I haven't played that for a Harvest Moon game for like 20 years, for like one pound. Well, I think yeah, it was a pound, but I had like the coins that you generate, so it didn't actually cost me anything. And the two oxen free games were both like 80p, which I think is just incredible. Like the first oxen free game is very good. I, I, I didn't finish it, but I was very close to the end. I think I got stuck. Um, but I'd had it when it was on Game Pass and Xbox, so I haven't actually bought it. And then Oxen Free 2 only came out a couple of years ago. So picked up both of them. It's kind of horror adjacent in Oxen Free. There's kind of elements of psychological horror. Um, but yeah, worth checking out. Worth checking out for sure. Um, and outside of that, yeah, that's kind of, I guess, it for horror. I will say... I won't go into... I won't... I won't go into spoilers on it. I did receive in the post the uh, Alien Romulus one-shot, which has a foreword from director Fede Alvarez. The definitive prequel to the blockbuster film. I've been very hyped for this. Um, in terms of will it answer some questions, it's meant to bridge the gap between the opening couple of minutes of Romulus and then what happens to the crew and it does um i guess to give it a to give it a brief review here again not avoiding not going into spoilers it didn't answer a fan theory which i thought would have been cool but ultimately you can't hold fan theories as the benchmark for what should or shouldn't happen in a comic. You have to kind of trust what the writers are doing. They're telling the story. But based on the video evidence online, it would appear that a certain uh, story thread could have been mentioned in here, and it isn't. Um, I would say it's a very small comic, and I think that's probably partially me having bias because I'm used to graphic novels, collected trade paperbacks. I've bought the odd comic in the past, outside of when I was a child, um, and I've always just preferred to get a trade paperback, because one, you get the basically complete story, depending on how epic the uh, the uh, the narrative goes, but also it's kind of more bang for your buck. Um, you know, comics these days, like this was like four, four pound, five pound, six pound maybe, I can't remember, um, and it's maybe 30 pages, of which I'd say about five at least at ads for other marvel releases um and it just it moves at quite a very quite a quick pace which just left me feeling a bit like it's kind of turned out a little unnecessary like you can scan through it very quickly and be like all right so that's what happened okay cool um i yeah i'd have to say i was kind of disappointed i was very excited for it um left a little bit disappointed just just to be honest uh that being that being said in terms of a score i think i will give it 5.5 5 out of 10 um the the artwork is decent it's not amazing um yeah just a little deflated really i suppose is the the main way that i can kind of describe it um but then saying that that's just me probably going into it with too much hype hoping you know hoping for confirmation of things that just we didn't get and you know that's on me but hopefully other people get enjoyment out of it and maybe there's things that i missed because i maybe read it a bit too quickly but uh yeah 5.5 .5 on my comic rating which I think is the first for the show. Uh, anyway, without further ado, we need to jump into some horror news. That was the news. Ho, 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 ho. I realise I did the end part of the news as opposed to the intro news. This is the news. Oh, oh, oh. Jumped ahead of the game initially. Jumped ahead of the game. I said that was the news, and more fool I. Uh, anyway, as per usual, all the news comes from bloodydisgusting.com. Check them out. Loads of great write ups, all that good stuff on there. 
This is from John Squires. These are the 10 new horror releases from this past week. Um, so, in the wake of Mr. Crockett, Hulu's Huluween lineup continues this week with the original horror comedy Carved, which spewed pumpkin guts onto the platform beginning Monday. Um, we'll skip past this because we're going to talk about it in our review later on. Moving on. From Epic Pictures horror label Dread and director Jill G Giva Gizian uh, comes indie horror movie Ghost Game, which just made its way onto VOD outlets on Tuesday. In the film, after discovering his girlfriend Laura's involvement in an internet challenge to secretly live alongside unsuspecting residents, Finn persuades her to take him on her next adventure. They target Holton House, a notoriously haunted manor recently purchased by a new family. Upon entering, the thrill-seeking couple experiences chilling, unexplained phenomena. It quickly becomes clear that they are not the only ones haunting the manor. Uh, as the new owners descend into madness and threatens the family, um, which began as a game, what began as a game turns deadly, forcing Laura and Vin to fight for their survival. Kia Dorsey, Zane Haider, and Michael C. Williams star in Ghost Game. Ghost Game is written by Adam Césaire, who did uh, Last Night at Terrace Lanes and Clown in a Cornfield, with Eduardo Sanchez of Blair Witch Project fame on board as executive producer. I've read, well, I've listened to the Audible of Clown in a Cornfield. Uh, yeah, I didn't think it was that good. <laughs> Uh, I was kind of hyped for it, like um, this new novel, horror novel franchise. Um, yeah, it's, no, it's one of those things where you go for these creepy kills, but you have to have characters that you have some amount of vested interest in. I didn't. Couldn't care less about any of them, so uh, yeah. Um, okay, it kind of sounds like that uh, frogging. I think it's called frogging where you live in someone's house without them knowing that you're living there. And there was that film called um, I See You or something like that that covered that, and that was pretty that was pretty decent, actually. Um, this is from the director of The Stylist. I think I did start watching The Stylist a little while ago. I might have even reviewed it. Didn't like it. So... There we go. Next up, the viral success of the Sharknado franchise has recently spawned knockoff movies, including Clownado and Monsternado. And Wild Eye releasing now has Catnado on their hands. Catnado was unleashed onto VOD outlets on Tuesday. In Catnado, the world faces a horrific onslaught of tornadoes, each unleashing hordes of enraged and deadly cats upon humanity. As chaos reigns, a disparate group of individuals have one mission, to stop this feline fury. But against such odds, and with only one life to spare per person, their battle becomes a catastrophic struggle for survival. And when the fur flies, it will be a meowsica. That's pretty good. Uh, Erica Raul Green, Joshua G. Otto, Blair Kelly, Serena Salieri, and Tucker Williams star. Catnado features segments directed by Donald Farmer, Curtis Everett, Elaine Huntington, Blair Kelly, James M. Myers, Melvin Pittman, Tim Ritter, Jerry Williams, and Logan Winton. Yeah, okay. I won't be watching that. Let's just be honest. Moving on. Trailblazing trans director Alice Mayo McKay uh, is back this week with holiday horror indie Carnage for Christmas, now available on VOD outlets at home. At only 20 years old and now with five features under her belt, Maya McKay further establishes herself as a shrewd filmmaker with a knack for fusing horror with a healthy dose of camp. In the film, when true crime podcaster and sleuth trans woman Lola visits her hometown at Christmas for the first time since running away and transitioning, the vengeful ghost of a historical murderer, an urban legend that seemingly arise to kill again. Alice Mayo McKay and this fellow genre artist Vera Drew, director and star of The People's Joker, um, as the film's editor and visual effects artist. Not watched the trailer. Um, not familiar with So Vam or T Blockers, so. We'll move on. We're doing well so far with the new films and me having any interest in them. Uh, next, in the card game The Werewolves of Miller's Hollow, paranoia and mistrust ensue as players seek to uncover the hidden identity of a werewolf in their midst. The French comedy feature Family Pack adapts the horror game, and it's now streaming exclusively on Netflix. Francois Ouzain helms the friend family-friendly feature. In the film, after discovering a mysterious card pack, or card game, I should say, a, uh, a family is thrust back in time to a medieval village where they must fend off dangerous werewolves each night. 
Frank Dubos, Jean Renault, and Suzanne Clement star. Not familiar with the card game. Um... Yep, yeah, moving on. Now, this is one I will watch. Uh, the hotly anticipated action horror movie Azrael, starring Samara Weaving, was released into theatres last month and just hit Shudder at home today. The high-concept action horror film from Republic Pictures stars Samara Weaving uh, and was directed by E.L. Katz, uh, of Channel Zero, Haunting of Blind Man and Cheap Thrills fame, from an original script by Simon Barrett, who worked on The Guest, Your Next, and Godzilla X Kong. In a world in which no one speaks... A devout female-led community hunts down a young woman who has escaped her imprisonment. Recaptured by its ruthless leaders, Azrael is to be sacrificed to pacify an ancient evil that resides deep within the surrounding wilderness, yet she will stop at nothing to ensure her own freedom and survival. From the seeds of this gritty, relentless parable of sacrifice and salvation comes an immersive, real-time action horror tale. Uh, buzz on this seems pretty good, so I have added it to my to-watch list. Definitely, definitely interested in that. Samara Weaving's brilliant, uh, and the people behind the, uh, the behind the camera have some good pedigree. So yeah, Shudder's been doing pretty decent with its uh, its weekly releases so far. So long may that continue. Next, from director Stephen Kostansky, who did The Void and Psycho Gorman, two very different films, is the zany horror comedy Frankie Frico, which debuted on VOD at home beginning today. In Frankie Frico, after calling a late-night party hotline that promises out-of-this-world fun, uptight yuppie Connor Sweeney must battle the pint-sized forces of evil unleashed through his phone line, led by the maniacal rock-and-roll goblin Frankie Frico. Here's the... F uh, there's a full plot synopsis, which we've kind of gone over and looked at before... Um, uh, yeah, I think this looks like it's just going to be a hell of a lot of fun. It seems to have... It's like Gremlins crossed with Psycho Gorman. And Psycho Gorman is is brilliant. The kids are quite annoying in it at times. But um, just the world and the, the design of all the characters in Psycho Gorman really pulls it together. And Psycho Gorman himself is PG. is is, is just absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed that. So... Um, yeah, this looks like a Gremlins version of that. Uh, Gremlins or Ghoulies. Definitely want to keep an eye out for. Next up. Grammy-nominated music video director Cooper Roberts makes his feature directorial debut with horror comedy All You Need Is Blood, now available on VOD outlets. Logan Riley Bruner, Neil Seethi, uh, and newcomer Emma Chase star alongside Mina Savari and comedian Eddie Griffin in the blood-soaked, heartfelt zombie comedy. The film follows Bucky, a 16-year-old aspiring director who dreams of becoming the next art house auteur sensation. After a strange meteor crash lands in his backyard and turns his deadbeat father into a brain-eating zombie, Bucky and his friends seize the opportunity to create the ultimate horror flick starring his undead dad. They'll soon realise that making a movie with real zombies is harder than they thought, especially when Bucky can't tolerate the sight of blood. It's a zombie film, but I love it because of how much heart it has. At its core, the story has so many meaningful themes it's exploring, buried under the carnage, said producer Jesse Corman. Yeah, we'll see. If it, if it lands on a streaming platform uh, for free, maybe. Maybe we'll give it a watch. Next, Melissa Barrera is back in Vertical's new horror comedy, Your Monster, which was released on th only in theatres beginning Friday, October 25th. The romantic monster movie looks to be a new spin on the classic tale of Beauty and the Beast. In the film, after her life falls apart, soft-spoken actress Laura Franco finds her voice again when she meets a terrifying, yet weirdly charming monster living in her closet. Um... Megan Fahey and Kaylee Foster, Kayla Foster, also star in the film from writer and director Cor um, Caroline Linding. Producers include Kayla Foster, Shannon Riley, Melanie Donkers, and Kira Carstensen. Uh, Melissa Pereira is cool. I like her and Abigail and the, uh, the two Scream films. Doesn't really sound like my sort of thing, to be honest. But, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> Next up. The latest from producer Sam Raimi's Raimi Productions and Hammerstone Studios is Netflix's Don't Move, which premiered on the streaming service October 25th. Kelsey Aspill and Finn Whitrock star. In the new Netflix horror movie, a woman alone in the forests of Big Sur must escape a serial killer with just 20 minutes left before her body completely shuts down. Adam Schindler and uh, Brian Netto directed Don't Move, uh, TJ 
Kim Fell and David White wrote the screenplay. Sam Raimi recently said in a statement of his own, I'm delighted to collaborate again with our co-directors Adam and Brian on this incredibly frightening and tense story full of so many twists and turns. It will deliver a fantastic horror punch to the audience. Yeah, this looks pretty good. I've only seen the initial kind of trailer and the concept for it. I, I dig. I dig. Um, I know it's on Netflix now. Um, I will see if I can allocate some time to watch that soon. Hopefully review it for the next show. Right, let's let's move on with the news, shall we? Uh, two new books dive deep into John Carpenter's Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. John Squires writes, From Harker Press, the publisher who brought you Taking Shape and the Soul of Wes Craven, comes the Escape Artist Zoology, a two-book collection that's now available. Join Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. historian Andreas Johansson for an unprecedented deep dive into the making of these two John Carpenter cult classics. Exhaustively researched, these volumes contain over 120 interviews with the cast and crew, along with more than 130 rare photographs and illustrations, many never before seen. In Escape Artist Volume 1, Escape from New York Interviews, join production historian Andreas Johansson and over 60 cast and crew for a journey back into the most dangerous place on Earth, where breaking out is impossible and breaking in is insane. Contained within this book are untold stories from the making of John Carpenter's cult classic Escape from New York. Explore virtually every aspect of production through in-depth interviews and vintage articles. The book also features over 50 rare behind-the-scenes photos, some never before seen. And in Escape Artist Volume 2, Escape from LA interviews, join production historian Andreas Johansson and over... Okay, all right. It's just going over the same thing again, but for Escape from LA. Um, so... I would be... I'd be interested uh, in the first one. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the, the John Carpenter fanboy in me would be interested in both, but I have to... I have to say, a book on Escape from L.A. interests me a hell of a lot more than a book on uh, Escape from New York. Escape from... I got that wrong. A book on Escape from New York interests me a hell of a lot more than a book on Escape uh, from L.A. Escape artist book. Um, no. Okay, I've just done a quick Google. Escape Artists, Volume 1. Doesn't look like it's available on uh, on Amazon in the UK, but yeah, Escape from LA is great. Oh, for fuck's sake, I've done it wrong again. Escape from New York is great. Escape from LA is mid nineties Carpenter when they just it wasn't quite as good as it had been. It wasn't to the high level that it had been. And I think partially that could be the changing of the times and uh, the budgets available. So in Escape from L.A., got that right this time, there's some terrible CGI. And there's some terrible CGI in, in a couple of uh, of his later films. And it's a shame. I mean, it's a different decade and whatnot. And obviously it comes down to budgets available. And all, all these things are going to be factors. But... Um, Escape from L.A. is basically a remake of Escape from New York, um, just with surfing. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think I thought I, actually I thought before a few times in the past I need to give Escape from L.A. another go, and then I end up giving it another go, and then I go, yeah. <laughs> it's just not as good as it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. But I'd be interested in the first book, and. Um, I'm sure I saw on the, the little blurb that there's mention of the unproduced prequel, so there's going to be a prequel book. Um, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for them, but I'm not going to go out of my way. Next up, 28 years later, Ralph Fiennes reveals plot details for Danny Boyle's sequel. Uh, John Squire's write-up. Filming is already wrapped on Danny Boyle's 28 Years Later, the long-awaited sequel to 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later, that intends to launch a brand new trilogy. Hmm. Okay, we know my thoughts on uh, a new film spearheading a trilogy. Okay. Uh, in fact, Ralph Fiennes spills the beans in a chat with IndieWire that the first two movies have been shot. Fiennes also served up some plot details for 28 years later that were previously under wraps. He tells the outlet, 
Britain is 28 years into this terrible plague of infected people who are violent, rabid humans with a few pockets of uninfected communities, and it centres on a young boy who wants to find a doctor to help his dying mother. He leads his mother through the beautiful northern English terrain, but of course around them hiding in forests and hills and woods of the infected. But he finds a doctor who is a man he might think is going to be weird and odd, but actually is a force for good. That doctor, you might have guessed it, is played by Ralph Fiennes. Danny Boyle and Nats Garland are reteaming for the 28 Years Later trilogy, with Garland writing the first movie, and Boyle back in the director's chair for at least the, fir the saga's first movie. 28 Years Later arrives in theatres on June 20th, 2025 from Sony. The horror movies cast includes Jack O'Connell, Jodie Comer, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Eric Kellyman and Ralph Fiennes. Killian Murphy is executive producing and reportedly returning to star. Nia da Costa will direct the second instalment in the trilogy. So this is pretty interesting. I mean, I I enjoy 28 Days Later. I've only seen 28 Weeks Later the once, and I remember it being decent. But I thought the concept of having this returning infected, which is, uh, was it Robert Carlyle's character? I just thought, well, we've never been shown the infected to be intelligent like th to remember people and sort of pursue them not, not i mean it's been a while since i've seen that film so i could be wrong there but he kept cropping up and i thought that just seems a bit convenient and i get it it's film logic whatever but um it, it did seem a little bit more in quotation marks here hollywood than uh, than the original which had a real british feel to it um but I'm interested to see what they do next. I mean, Danny Ball's a great director. Alex Garland uh, is an incredible writer. So we shall see. And then finally on the news, IDW joining forces with Paramount for comics based on Smile, Event Horizon, and more. John Squires writes, A handful of Paramount horror properties are making the leap into the world of comic books with IDW Publishing's new venture, IDW Dark, announced at New York Comic Con. For starters, the company teased upcoming comics based on Paramount franchises including Smile, A Quiet Place, Event Horizon, Sleepy Hollow, and The Twilight Zone. Additionally, 30 Days of Night is getting a brand new comic sequel with 30 Days of Night Falling Sun. 30 Days of Night was, of course, originally a comic book that became a movie. This brand new horror-focused IDW Dark imprint will also launch new original horror titles, bringing captivating, original, or captivating horror stories from celebrated and fresh writers and artists. Horror is everywhere today in the world and on the shelves, IDW's Maggie Howell said in a statement out of New York Comic Con. So what sets IDW Dark apart? Horror is in our blood. This imprint is our way of doubling down on the work the, com the company has been doing throughout our 25-year history as a premier publisher of horror comics. Um, okay. Kind of interested in this. Comics in the world of Smile. To an extent, A Quiet Place. Event Horizon. Not so much Sleepy Hollow. And The Twilight Zone have me interested. And 30 Days of Night. I think the first film was brilliant. I never even saw the sequel. And I did look into the comics once, but it was an, an art style which wasn't really my thing. So I never really sort of followed up on that. But um, the, the film 30 Days of Night, I think, is excellent. So, if these IDW Dark come out in trade paperbacks, then I'll give them a go. Because uh, certainly there's a few properties I'd like to see in the world of comics. I mean, Event Horizon as well. There's so much... Uh, scope there to kind of go into like the original crew if there's a sequel event or whatnot um very very interested in reading some of those in twilight zone you know there's it's a great property you can get a lot of mileage out of um well there we go and that ghouls and fiends is it for this week's horror news that was the news ho 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 There we go, now it's time for reviews. So first up in the reviews, Ghouls and Fiends, we have Natty Knox. Now, it's a weird title for a film, sure. Uh, but this is uh, it's a new horror film, and we're going to, just to do my usual blurb, we're going to talk about the highs, the lows, a bit about the plot, where available, and then I'll give you a score out of 10. So... 
As with another film on our review schedule, there isn't a Wikipedia. So I've only got a very brief blurb of the plot, and I'll have to kind of go on memory. I've watched a lot of horror films uh, this uh, this week, so my memory is pretty lax, to, to be sure. So, from the director of Halloween 4 comes a new screen classic, Natty Knox. So this is directed by uh, Dwight Little, Dwight H. Little, uh, written by Benjamin Olsen. And it stars Bill Moseley, Danielle Harris, Robert Englund, along with Charlotte Fontaine Jardim, Thomas Roby, and Noen Perez. So you've got some uh, some known names in horror there, mixing with some some young blood. So, um, starring horror legends Bill Mosley, Daniel Harris, and Robert Englund, this small town thriller introduces babysitter Britt Henderson, played by newcomer Charlotte Fontaine uh, Fountain Jardim, on Halloween Eve. Britt and her kids, um, who are basically the same age as her, have to survive the horror of serial killer Abner Honeywell who is himself the traumatised son of B-movie horror legend Natty Knox. Um, okay. So, to kind of go into it, there's this initial backstory where a woman in a small town is putting it about, for want of a better term, um, engaging in fornification with, uh, with a chap, and uh, the townsfolk drag her outside as a harlot, throw her into a barn, and set fire to it. Many years later, this town um, has this legend of Natty Knox, where if you knock on a house nine times and run away, or she may appear, it's not really that clear. But the idea being is that there's this joke that uh, it's become a bit of a tradition about hauntings, and they kind of have this... Uh, woman on a crucifix kind of symbol kind of like guy forks i suppose um but it has some notoriety in the town because natty knox was a b-movie horror screen queen whose career fell on hard times as she got older and her looks faded um so the kids and just playing around in this town but they happen to go to this one house where a uh, a chap bill mosley is seen choking out a woman i see through the window Next thing they know, there's uh, art, like poster art, uh, not poster, like missing persons, posters of the woman that they saw in the house. And the person that they saw doing the choking turns out to also be a police officer. So they're trying to do a teen investigation, as you do, while this uh, police officer seems to be becoming more and more possessed by Natty Knox is getting this these weird black circles around his eyes while he's going around killing. So we have small roles in this for Robert Englund and Danielle Harris appears briefly at a couple of moments, but it's predominantly uh, Bill Mosley as our antagonist. Um, this does fall very much into that realm of we've got a bit of money, a little bit of money for a film. We'll spend that on getting some known names in the horror world in, on board. But the the plot is pretty th threadbare. Uh, there is nothing new in this. There's not really any potential. There's not really any memorable kills. Um, the, uh, the effects when Natty Knox appears, because normally just as a kill is about to uh, occur, a ghost is shown in a mirror. That looks kind of cheesy, like kind of quite cheap um, effects. Um, and nothing really kind of stands out in this. I mean, it's one of those horrors that if you want to just chuck on in the background, it's not terrible to the point where you'll just be like, Jesus Christ, that you know, just hurry up and end this. Like the performances are okay. No one really stands out, but no one's awful. Um... I wouldn't necessarily say I noticed anyone in this that I thought, okay, well, they're definitely going to be a standout. Um, it's just one of those kind of like cheap made for DVD slashes. Um, I guess that's kind of the best way to do it, but for the streaming age. Yeah, it, there's nothing really kind of to write home about with it. I mean, it's fine, it's there. I mean, I'll say it's fine. I'm going to give it four out of ten. So it, it it's fine to an extent of it's not like below four. It's not a three. 
but four isn't exactly a high benchmark, is it? Um, it's a all right four, not decent, but it's an all right four. Four out of ten for Natty Knox. Um, there's not really much to say about it. Similar to this film, Carved. Now we watched Mr. Crockett last week from the uh, Huluween releases that have come to Disney Plus in the UK, and similarly this has come to disney plus but i remember when we looked at this in the news for the new film releases and i remember thinking or saying yeah doesn't you know if there's if there's a film i have to watch which is pumpkin related on my uh 31 days of halloween i'll give it a go but otherwise i'm not going to look out for it well i saw it on disney plus and i figured hey we got a show to do let's get a new film watched uh so this is written and directed by Justin Harding, also written by Cheryl Meyer, starring Peyton Elizabeth Lee, Corey Fogelmanis, Carla Jimenez, and I suppose the named actor in this. Um, Elvis Nolasco is also in this, who's in Mr. Crocker. I thought I recognised him. Um, but DJ Qualls, uh, he is in this. People know him from Road Trip or Supernatural. Um, everyone else in this I'm not really familiar with. So, a group of survivors find themselves that found themselves trapped in a historical reenactment village on Halloween, where they must unite to battle a sentient, vengeful pumpkin. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the film. So, but this is basically... Um, the small town village, there was a, tra a tragedy many years ago. They don't really go too much into that tragedy. It doesn't really play too much of a pivotal point. Or if it does, I didn't pick up on it because I wasn't paying a lot of attention. Um, and they they have these traditions of putting on these performances whilst at the same time, like, you know, like a historical theatre. Uh, whilst also having these pumpkin carving contests. Uh, there happens to be one of these actors in the theatre who has got to be destined for Broadway. Of course. And anyway, it um, one of the uh, entrants to this pumpkin carving contest is a stoner, very clearly, who grabs this pumpkin from his, uh, his the family-owned pumpkin patch. But this one looks a bit different. It looks a bit gnarly. When he takes it to the pumpkin carving contest, it sees the other pumpkins being carved up with glee by the people around it. Because to carve a pumpkin, cut, cut into the top of it, cut its head open, and you take the innards out. You take the brain out, basically. Uh, and in doing so, whatever is making this pumpkin sentient, I don't know if that's ever even confirmed as to, oh, toxic spill, or, oh, it's been made with uh, experimental... Is it not... Not really confirmed as to what is going on there, but um, it then it then becomes sentient and starts using vines, assuming they're vines from it, to stab at people and cut off people's limbs and tear off people's heads. Like the violence in this is pretty gnarly. I will give it that. Um, there's a few people that it kills where it kind of hangs them up in the air, rips their arm off stabs them like something out of berserk like rapid fire stabs like through straight through the body before then just sort of tightening around the neck and whacking the head off um so from that element it's decent and it is kind of comedy horror in the sense of it's kind of light-hearted at times but also has moments of terror at times um we do jump into the action fairly quickly. I mean, it opens with it opens with the kill before it jumps back to the day before. So we get the the terror occurring, and then we jump back to well, what's led to this. But in that jump back, we it doesn't really take long for it to kind of get to where it all kicks off in the terror. And I think from that point, we're then basically in a stalk and slash sequence with our survivors who start dwindling in numbers against this pumpkin. It is kind of fun, I will say that, but it is, I, it's a marked step down from Mr. Crockett. But Mr. Crockett, I thought, I thought was like a madcap adult version of a Goosebumps episode, or Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, carved less so. Um, it, it, it's fun enough, but 
where Mr. Crockett had Mr. Crockett as a standout. We've got the same actor in this, but in a much smaller role, in a very different role, of course. Um, and so there wasn't that transposition of standout role in this from, from anyone, really. Uh, DJ Qualls is, you know, is a, a nice presence in this, but he's, he doesn't have that much to do. It's... I mean, it's better than Natty Knox. It's a 5 out of 10 for Carved. I wasn't expecting much from this, and I didn't get much from this. But there's a bit of heart there, a bit of humour. But again, this felt very straight to DVD, I suppose, is the term. Straight to video. 5 out of 10. Sorry for the dogs. Always happens. And then finally, what I watched last night, Smile 2. Smile 2 is 2024 American psychological supernatural horror film written and directed by Parker Finn. Sequel to Smile of 2022. Oh, Smile 2 is a 2024 film. I think I got my words mixed up there. So a sequel to Smile uh, from 2022. The film stars Naomi Scott as a pop star who begins to experience a series of increasingly disturbing events as she is about to go on tour. It also features Rosemary DeWitt, Lucas Gage, Miles Gutierrez, Riley, Peter Jacobson, Ryan Nichol Ray Nicholson, I should say, um, Dylan Guilela, Raul Castillo, as well as Kyle Golner reprising his role from the first film. In March 23, following the commercial su success of Smile, Finn signed a first look deal to develop additional horror projects, and in the following April, a sequel to Smile had entered pre production. Um, now, as I normally do, I'll read a bit of the blurb, but this blurb does start from the very start of the film the uh, the plot um and i do feel that that is a hell of a spoiler so we're gonna jump past the opening part of the film um so we'll, we'll skip past that um in new york city grammy winning pop star uh, Sky Riley prepares for her comeback tour after a public struggle with substance abuse and a car crash that killed her boyfriend, actor Paul Hudson. Despite constant supervision from her mother and manager Elizabeth and assistant Joshua, Sky sneaks out to buy Vicodin from Lewis for her back pain. Sky witnesses him in a manic state, smile, and smash his own face in with a weight plate, killing himself. Traumatised, Sky flees, too afraid to call the police and reveal her presence. Sky begins to experience physical and auditory hallucinations, including people eerily smiling at her, causing her mental health to deteriorate rapidly. So, uh, yeah, we won't really go too much more into it because let's just try and avoid as, as many spoilers as possible. Um, so, if you've seen the original Smile film, this picks up six days later, which is... If you've seen the original Smile film, you know that there is a time limit on the curse when you inherit it. So the curse basically being that someone becomes almost haunted by this parasitic entity where it will infect your mind, basically cause torment and uh, mental torture where you are seeing things that aren't there or things that are there but only you can see them and causing your 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 mental state to break down before essentially completely taking over you and killing yourself under its control in front of a witness and in doing so that transfers the curse or the parasite onto them so I kind of think it follows um where it's like that's a sexually transmitted curse and it will continuously follow you until it reaches you, at which point it kills you, and then it goes on to the previous person. The only way to transfer it on is to, is to have sex with someone. With this, it transfers itself on via causing you to commit suicide in front of, uh, in front of someone. Um, I realise I said the S word, and I'm pretty sure for things like YouTube and that, it uh, that's a bit of an issue. But that's what happens in the film. I can only sort of comment on what occurs in the film. Um, so as the, as mentioned, this picks up six days after the first film. So 
I won't go into the events of that, but if you've seen the original film, you'll probably have an idea of who we are following in that moment. Um, when we jump into the behind the scenes in the life of Sky Riley, it really gives you a, a look into the world has this appearance of a, of a pop star as, oh, they're having a comeback and people love them and their music and uh, everyone adores them and you know, people just want to have photos taken with them and be close to their heroes. But all of the pressure of doing, you know, the, the rehearsals for the tour and it's all about the tour and all the money that's gone into that and all the people that are depending on you and all of this stuff. And she is still suffering uh, from physical and mental trauma from this event where her career took a bit of a skydive through drugs and alcohol abuse, which uh, led to... A fatal car crash for her then boyfriend um so she's suffering a lot with that so you know it's kind of then sucks for her a lot to suddenly get to this curse this parasite passed on to her um the budget for this felt feels massive but looking at it the budget is 28 million which for horror films is pretty darn darn good but in terms of mainstream films that's not that big at all so they've done a great job of making this film feel like a enormous budgeted production i mean 28 million is still, is still a lot of money don't get me wrong um i would say the smiles themselves are much creepier in this than the first film that was my only complaint with the first film was for a film centered on creepy smiles i've seen creepy smiles in other films like insidious conjuring that sort of thing this does have its share of creepy smiles. Um, I think it does a slightly better job with the jump scares, that they aren't as frequent at times as they were in the first film, but they are a bit more effective. And there's one particular one, um, which was just, I think it made everyone in the cinema jump and yelp. Uh, certainly did people on our row. Um, <laughs> so... From that regard, it, it it was very, very effective. I mean, I think the main thing that I have to say for this film is I enjoyed Smile. It was a film that grew on me with uh, with follow-up watches. But, um, God, my dogs are going crazy. But, um, oh, I think it's because the front door's going. But with, uh, with, with that being said, this film improves on those elements um, more. The scares, I think, are better. The smiles themselves are creepier. The one of the standout moments for me, or the scarier moments for me in the original, was uh, was during the finale, where we kind of see the true face of this creature and how it takes over its uh, host fully. And what we get in this is uh, an extension of that, where they kind of just take the creepy visuals and expand on them massively there's a couple of moments of the ele evolution of how this this thing looks this thing appears and both of those moments i thought were just pretty damn terrifying there's one in particular where its eyes just look just i don't know how they came up with this look uh for this kind of mutation but it just it was yeah pretty pretty gnarly I would say, if you're thinking about watching this, don't watch the extended trailers. So there's been a trailer which has been around for a little while, so showing you know, in the cinema, social media, probably TV. But when I went to the cinema to see Salem's Lot, there was a new trailer. And the new trailer gave away quite a bit of the film. It gave away a bit of a, a, a plot point that is revealed in the latter half of the film and feels like a it just felt like one of those trailers that's a little bit unnecessary in terms of you didn't need to add in these things of how they're going to try and attack it and fight back because that just feels like you're kind of setting the audience up to know where this is definitely going um it didn't affect my enjoyment much really but it was just one of those things where i thought i just thought at the time when i saw that trailer this has told me a bit too much i would say um Naomi Scott is is incredible in this, kind of similar to um, the lead. I can't remember her name in the original Smile. Um, let's just have a quick look while I've got it open. It's like it's, um, Sosie Bacon. 
So I'm probably pronouncing that terribly. So similar, similar to her performance being the standout, um, Naomi Scott is the, the the just front and center in this throughout, and her performance in this is actually incredible. It has to be said. Um, going down that roller coaster of basically losing her mind. There's a particular moment when she sees something horrific occur right in front of her. And when she goes to try to escape and she looks at her hand and her hand is holding uh, an object that basically implicates her as being the one to have actually done a horrific act as opposed to just witnessing it. And I thought that was just done incredibly, incredibly well. Um, there's some twists and turns as we enter the final, uh, the final act of the film, but I won't give anything away in that regard. Um, and then the final moment is just shocking, but in a great way. Uh, I, yeah, I think Smile 2 has done what sequels generally should do, and that is take the elements from the first, from the first entry, expand on them and improve on them where possible. And I think where the original Smile film was good, it's pretty good, but it wasn't like it wasn't like watching Halloween for the first time or watching you know a number of other first entries in the series. There's a good opportunity to expand on that, expand the law, expand on the scares, and expand on where we can go from there. And this does a great job of that. Uh, so I think that has to be applauded. I'm gonna give Smile two nine out of ten. 9 out of 10. If you enjoyed Smile, I think you'll love Smile 2. If you didn't like Smile, maybe give Smile 2 a go, but I guess it would come down to what you didn't like about Smile. If you thought there's the story, then you're kind of getting more of an elaboration of, on that. Um, so it maybe won't be for you, but uh, I'll definitely say give it, a, give it a watch. And if you haven't seen the original film, that's currently on Netflix in the UK. And I would say it's worth a watch because this does continue pretty much a week later from the first film. Definitely worth a go, I would say. Right, ghouls and fiends, that is it for another edition of the Ministry of Horror. Thank you very much for joining me for another week of uh, scares and ghouls and uh, goblins and vampires and werewolves and Frankenstein's monster uh, and creatures from the Black Lagoon. Um, so I have to watch at some point today a... Uh, Alfred Hitchcock film, which, as mentioned, I'm going to go with Rear Window. So for the rest of the week, so tomorrow is B-Movie Madness. I'm going to have, have fun looking for a good B-Movie. Family friendly. Do you know what? I might go for Hocus Pocus. You know, my sister used to love that as a kid, so I'd watch it quite often when we were, when we were little. And that's family friendly. Maybe I'll do that. Frankenstein, I'm probably... I'm, I don't know, I might look for a Hammer Frankenstein. I was initially thinking OG, because I do have the Universal Horror book set. Black and white, I'm going to go with Nosferatu, because I'm very hyped for Robert Eggers' Nosferatu remake. And then Halloween night, it's going to be Halloween. I don't care how many times I've watched the original Halloween on Halloween. It works. It's there for a reason. Um, gonster, gonster do that. Um, so, there we go. Thank you very much, Ghouls and Fiends, for listening. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel, be sure to like the video, share it around. We had a huge number, for the channel at least, huge number listening or watching the VHS Beyond show. But the last two shows have, have uh, dropped off massively in, in views. Now, that could be I need to get better at uh, sharing when the shows come out, because I'm not that good at that, I'll be honest. Um, but if you do like the YouTube channel, be sure to give the videos a watch, be sure to like, share them around, help you know, get the videos out there on the algorithms. Uh, if you listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, be sure to give the shows a follow, subscribe, whatever it is on your various platform, and get it out there. The uh, the listens have been great, and the US, the USA has overtaken as the uh, the majority of the fan base. So that's great. Thank you very much for listeners in America, UK fans, fans in other countries. Get your listens up. Come on, get your get your numbers counted. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I will catch you later on. Goodbye.